But although they had now seen the last of Tissaphernes, the Hellenes were still a very long way from the end of their journey. Difficulties of another and more serious kind still lay before them, and the question of their further route caused the generals great anxiety, for, in front of the fruitful valley in which they were encamped, there stretched before them a stern and rugged mountain country inhabited by a nation of savages. The limit of this mountain district was the river Tigris, and the only way of avoiding it was by crossing the Tigris. No path could be found by which they could pass between the mountains and the river, for immense rocks stretched out far over the water so that there was not space for even a single person to go by. But the river was far too deep and broad to be forded, and they had no other means of crossing. When they tried to measure its depth with their long spears, they could not reach the bottom, even close to the shore. Whilst the generals were consulting together as to what could be done, a Rhodian soldier came to them to ask for an audience and said, If you will promise me a talent of silver and provide me with all that I shall need for carrying out my plan, I will build you a bridge over the Tigris capable of bearing two thousand hoplites. Then he went on to explain his plan. We have here, he said, a great many cows, sheep, goats, and asses. All these animals must give me their skins, for I shall want two thousand leather bags. I shall also want all the straps used for the baggage animals. The skins must be inflated and tied up securely. I shall then attach one of the straps to either end of each skin so that it can be fastened to the next one and steady it in the water with large stones let down from the underside to serve as anchors. When the skins are all in their places and fastened together, I shall cover them thoroughly with earth and brushwood to prevent them from being slippery and the bridge will be complete. Each skin will bear the weight of two men, so that you will have a bridge able to carry four thousand. The generals agreed that it was an excellent idea, but unhappily they could not turn it to any account, for, on the further side of the river, troops of Persian cavalry were already collected to oppose their crossing, and by them the men employed in working at the bridge would be shot down one by one, long before it was sufficiently finished to carry the soldiers across. The crossing of the river was thus out of the question, and there remained nothing but the road over the mountains, although they knew not whither it led. They were like mariners driven out of their course by violent storms, who neither know where they are, nor what is before, or behind, or on either side of them. Gladly would the Hellenes have given a good deal of their scanty store of money for a small sheet of paper which today can be bought anywhere for a few pence, a map of the country that lay before them. But in those days no such thing had ever been heard of. All they could do was to question the prisoners, and from them they learned that southwards, in the direction from whence they had come, were the provinces of Babylonia and Media, to the east were the cities of Susa and Babylon, to the west the provinces of Lydia and Ionia, and that the road northwards over the mountains would lead them through the land of the Cardukians, a fierce, war-loving race, who had never been conquered. Once, the great king had sent into their country an army of one hundred and twenty thousand men to subdue them, but of all that great host not one had ever seen his home again. If the Hellenes should succeed in getting through the country of the Cardukians, they would then reach the province of Armenia, and after that they would be able to journey on without further hindrance. Although in themselves not very formidable enemies, within the limits of their own country the Cardukians were almost invincible. It was a mountainous district, in which the hills rose sheer and steep from the rich, fertile valleys lying far below, where the Cardukians built their houses and pastured their flocks. They seldom risked coming to close quarters with their enemies, but contented themselves with shooting from a distance at any intruders who might be rash enough to enter their country. This method of warfare was the more effective as they had considerable skill as marksmen and were beyond the possibility of pursuit. Every path and every recess of their wild mountain country was familiar to them, and they were extremely agile, being accustomed from their childhood to clamber up and down the rocks like cats. Moreover, they had the advantage of being burdened with no armor and but little clothing, and they carried no weapons but bows and slings. Their bows and arrows were unusually large, the bow measuring nearly three cubits in length, and the arrows more than two cubits. In order to shoot, they rested the lower end of the bow on the ground and placed one foot upon it, then, drawing back the string as far as it would go, they discharged the arrow with such force that it was able to pierce right through a leather jerkin and penetrate deep into the flesh beneath. 
With this barbarous people the Hellenes were most anxious to remain at peace, and they desired nothing better than to be allowed to pass quietly through the country, paying for everything that they might be obliged to take, in order to supply themselves with food. The prisoners who had told them about the defeat of the Persian army had spoken also of an alliance made by the Carducians with the satrap of the province nearest their country. With him they had established an occasional exchange of friendly intercourse, but, as they hated all the other Persians as bitterly as ever, the Hellenes hoped that on the principle that the enemy of my enemy is my friend, the Carducians might be inclined to regard them with favor and make a treaty with them. Nevertheless, they resolved to enter the country very cautiously and, after having offered sacrifices and prayers to the gods, that their enterprise might be brought to a successful issue, they set out while it was still dark in the hope of crossing the first mountain unperceived. By daybreak they were in the country of the Carducians, Chirisophus leading the van, which included all the light-armed troops, Xenophon in the rear commanding the hoplites, while the camp followers as usual marched in the center. Chirisophus passed unobserved over the crest of the mountain and on the further side found several villages scattered about in the ravines and recesses of the country. Great was the astonishment of the inhabitants at the unexpected appearance of the Hellene soldiers. They came pouring out of their houses and, although the Hellenes made signs of friendliness and called out that they had no wish to injure them, they would not stop to listen, but fled away into the mountains with their wives and children. Meanwhile, the rear was still crossing the height over which Chirisophus had just passed in safety. The road was narrow, and the long line of combatants and camp followers could make but slow progress. Night had fallen before those in the extreme rear could reach the villages, and on their way they were attacked by the terrified Carducians who had fled at the approach of Chirisophus. Some of them were killed, and others wounded, with stones and arrows. Happily, the enemy were as yet but few in number, or they might have sustained more serious loss. The Hellenes established themselves for the night in the villages of which they had been left in possession and found in the houses many vessels and utensils of brass, but, as they still hoped to enter into peaceful relations with the Carducians, they took no spoil, excepting only such food as was necessary. There was no one from whom to buy, and so they were obliged to help themselves. During the night, they were left undisturbed, but great bonfires could be seen flaming away upon the tops of the mountains. They had been set alight by the Carducians in order that the signal might be passed on from point to point, all over the country, to call together all the people to defend their land from the strangers who had entered it. There could no longer be any doubt that the Carducians were determined to regard the Hellenes as enemies, and again the generals and captains met in consultation. As on the occasion when they had declared war against the great king, they determined to leave behind everything that could possibly be spared. All prisoners were set free, and of the transport animals they retained only such of the strongest as were quite indispensable. By this means it became possible to reduce the quantity of provisions to be carried, and moreover the men who had been formerly employed in attending to the discarded animals could now be added to the fighting force. The soldiers were informed of the decision arrived at, and desired to be ready for a fresh start immediately after the morning meal. Then the generals placed themselves at a narrow part of the road and, as the army marched past, took away from the men anything that they might have tried to carry off in defiance of the order. The day did not pass without several skirmishes with the Carducians, but for the most part they were able to march on steadily without serious fighting. On the following day, a great snowstorm made it difficult for the Hellenes to continue their march. Nevertheless, they were obliged to go forward, as they had not a sufficient supply of food. The Carducians now beset them in greater numbers than before and harassed them with showers of stones and arrows, especially whenever they were hindered by coming to a part of the road that was particularly narrow. Xenophon, who led the rearguard, was several times obliged to halt and drive back the enemy, giving, as he did so, a signal with the trumpets, in order that Chirisophus and the van might wait for him. No sooner did the Hellenes turn and prepare to charge than the Carducians disappeared as if by magic, but in a very short time they were again in the rear, shooting at them as before. At first, Chirisophus waited for the hoplites so that they had no great difficulty in keeping up with the rest of the army, but after a time he took no more notice of the signals, and the distance between the van and the rear became greater and greater, until at last the march of Xenophon and his men was more like a flight than a retreat, whilst all the time they were exposed to the arrows and missiles of the enemy. When in the evening they rejoined their comrades, 
Xenophon complained to Chirisophus of the one of consideration he had shown in obliging the men to run and fight at the same time. In consequence of this, several of them, he said, had fallen, amongst whom were two of the best, and moreover it had been impossible to rescue their bodies. Among the Hellenes it was regarded as a terrible calamity if anything interfered to prevent the dead from receiving funeral honors. If nothing else could be done, the corpse must at least be solemnly sprinkled with earth in the name of the gods, or the shade of the dead man would find no rest in the lower world. But it was not without urgent necessity that Chirisophus had hurried forward during the latter part of the march, and he answered, We were told by the guides that the mountains in front of us are almost impassable, and that there is but one steep road, that which you see yonder, leading to the only pass by which we can cross them. I hope that by hurrying we might be able to seize this pass before the enemy should occupy it, but unhappily they have reached it first. They are posted there in great numbers, and I do not see how we are to drive them from it. Xenophon was obliged to admit that Chirisophus was fully justified in acting as he had done, but he had something to report, which made the situation a little less hopeless. As the Carducians persisted in molesting us, he said, we lay in ambush for them behind some bushes. This gave us the opportunity of doing them an injury and also of resting ourselves for a moment, for we were quite out of breath. When a band of Carducians came by, we rushed out upon them and killed most of them, but two I was careful to take alive, and we have brought them as prisoners, for I thought they would be useful in guiding us through these mountains. They may be able to tell us of a second way not known to the guides we have had hitherto. The two prisoners were led forward to be examined, and the first one was asked if he did not know of another road leading to the pass. Although it was evident that he could, if he chose, give the information of which the Hellenes were in such pressing need, he persisted in saying that there was no other road. They threatened him with death if he continued obstinate, but it was of no avail, and, fearing lest the other Carducians should be encouraged to follow his example, they determined to show that they were not to be trifled with. It was absolutely essential to find another road, the fate of the whole army depended on it, and, in order to strike terror into the heart of the second man, they hanged his comrade before his eyes. This had the desired effect, and, when the second Carducian was questioned, he said, There is another road. My countrymen would not betray the secret, because his daughter lives near it with her husband. I am ready to show it to you, and you will find it passable also for the baggage animals. In war, terrible things occur. For the sake of the general good, it is often necessary to be cruel. But still we cannot help regretting the fate of the brave man who for the love of his daughter gave himself over to death. On further questioning the Carducian, the generals discovered that the road which he promised to show them was at one point commanded by a peak already in possession of the enemy, who must be dislodged from it before the road could be used. This would probably be an enterprise of some risk, and the generals resorted to an expedient often used in war to rouse enthusiasm for a difficult and dangerous undertaking, namely that of calling for volunteers. About 2,000 men at once offered their services, of whom some were officers and others private soldiers. Having first eaten a good meal, they set out, as soon as it began to get dark, in a storm of wind and rain, guided by the Carducian, whom they had put into chains, lest he should desert them on the way. It was arranged that the band of volunteers should dislodge the Carducians from the height commanding the second road and remain there during the night. At dawn, they were to descend towards the pass and begin the attack upon it, giving at the same time a signal with the trumpets. On hearing the signal, a part of the army left below was to ascend as rapidly as possible by the first road and join them at the pass. In order to divert the attention of the enemy from the movements of the 2000, Xenophon set out at the same moment with the hoplites and made a feint of advancing up the first road leading to the pass. Coming, however, to a narrow ravine between great boulders of rock, he found the cliffs on either side crowded with Carducians, who had dragged to that place huge fragments of rock, besides stones of all sizes, ready to be hurled down upon the Hellenes. The moment the Carducians caught sight of the approaching enemy, down crashed the stone storm, making the most appalling noise as the great pieces of rock bounded from boulder to boulder, broke off into a thousand splinters, and then thundered to the ground, burying themselves finally deep in the earth. Had the Hellenes entered the ravine, not one of them would have escaped alive. But they had taken good care to keep well beyond the range of the deadly hail, only, from time to time, 
one or other of the captains would show himself from among the bushes on either side of the ravine as if he were looking for some other way of getting past. When it had become so dark that they could no longer be seen by the Cardukians, the Hellenes hastened back to the valley, where they were glad enough to prepare their evening meal, for they had had no dinner that day. All through the night they could hear the noise made by the Cardukians, who were still on the alert and who continued to pour down volleys of stones and rock, lest their enemies should slip past them in the darkness. Meanwhile, the two thousand volunteers had been led by their guide to a place which they believed to be the peak commanding the second road. There they found a number of Cardukians sitting comfortably around their fires, and, attacking them suddenly, they killed some and put the rest to flight. Then they sat down and spent the remainder of the night in front of the fires that had been kindled by the enemy, which, as it was excessively cold, they looked upon as a piece of great good fortune. At dawn, they proceeded towards the pass, very cautiously and silently, according to the instructions they had received, and, under cover of a thick mist, were able to come close up to the enemy unobserved. Then the trumpets gave the signal that had been agreed upon, and the Hellenes charged. The enemy saw that it was of no use to attempt to maintain their position and fled without a struggle, only a few of them being killed. This freed the road, up which Chirisophus and his men were making their way as fast as possible. It was excessively steep and narrow, and, in their eagerness to reach the top, many of the men climbed as best they could over places where there was no path, drawing one another up with the help of their spears. At last they reached the pass and joined the band of volunteers who were already in possession. Two-thirds of the army had now reached the pass, but for the rest there was still in store a long day of toil and fighting before they could arrive at the same spot. Xenophon and his rearguard of hoplites had undertaken the escort of the transport animals who had to be brought up to the pass by the second, more circuitous road, because the first was too steep for them. The animals were placed in the center of the line, half the troops marching in front of them and half behind. The rear had not proceeded far when they came in sight of a peak overlooking the road and discovered that it was occupied by the enemy. The volunteers had indeed thought that they had freed the road by driving the enemy from their campfires on the previous evening, but this proved not to be the case. Until the Cardukians could be ousted from the height, it would not be safe for either troops or cattle to pass beneath, and Xenophon at once told off some of his men for this service, with instructions to make the attack in such a manner as to give the Cardukians ample opportunity for running away. He did not want them to be forced to make a desperate stand, for he was anxious not to be delayed by having to stop and fight. Accordingly, a detachment of hoplites, headed by Xenophon himself, set out to climb the hill. As they did so, they were exposed the whole time to a constant volley of arrows and stones, discharged at them by the Cardukians from above, but no sooner had they reached the top than the Cardukians turned and fled, leaving the road below the peak free. A new difficulty, however, now presented itself, for from this peak a second came into sight, occupied just in the same manner. This would have to be fought for as the first had been, and moreover it would be necessary to leave a guard on the first peak to prevent the enemy from returning to it. For the Cardukians were like a swarm of flies, who can easily be driven away from the place where they have settled, but who return just as quickly the moment they are left alone again. And Xenophon knew that he could not hope to get his line of men and horses past the peak of which he had just taken possession before the Cardukians would have time to get back to it, for the road was so narrow that they were obliged to go very slowly. Accordingly, he left three captains, with the men serving under them, to guard the first peak, whilst he himself went forward towards the second. This was captured with the same toil and the same success as the first, but now a third came into view which had to be taken in like manner. Xenophon accordingly set forward to attack it, but in this case the task was easier than before, for the enemy abandoned the peak before the Hellenes arrived at it so that it could be climbed without hindrance or danger. So far, all had gone well, but now from the rear came disastrous news. The men left in charge of the first peak had been surprised and defeated by the enemy, who had killed almost all of them, including two out of the three captains. A few only had saved their lives by making a desperate leap from the rocks into the road below. There was nothing for it but to reconquer the peak which they had thought already secured, a terrible addition to the work of a day already overcrowded with toils and risks which cost many a brave soldier his life. Xenophon himself was at one time in great peril.
and climbing one of the mountains, his shield-bearer became so frightened at the shower of stones and arrows pouring down from above that he turned and fled, taking the shield with him. Xenophon was thus left unprotected, but happily one of the soldiers saw his danger and, hastening to his side, held his own shield so as to cover both. At last, however, the long march was over, and before nightfall the hoplites had rejoined their comrades at the pass, from whence they soon reached some well-to-do mountain villages where there was food in abundance, and where they could shelter themselves in comfortable huts. Their loss that day had been very severe, and unhappily it had been impossible to carry off the dead. To repair such a misfortune, no sacrifice could be too great, and accordingly Chirisophus and Xenophon sent a herald to the Cardukians, offering to restore the man who had acted as their guide, if the Cardukians, on their part, would give up the bodies of the fallen Hellenes. To this they agreed, and the Hellenes had the satisfaction of burying their comrades with the customary rites. It was, however, at no small cost that they had effected this exchange, for by so doing they had lost the services of the only man who could pilot them through this wild and unknown land. They were now without a guide, and, from the nature of the country, no extensive view could anywhere be gained. They could but direct their course by the sun and stars, and they decided to continue marching northwards towards the source of the Tigris. The next three days were spent in much the same manner as the last, the Cardukians disputing every step of their march and constantly assailing them with shots and stones hurled from a higher level. But at last, to their infinite joy, they came to the edge of the Cardukian country and could look down upon the broad plains of Armenia stretched out before them. They had only been seven days, in all, in the land of the Cardukians, and yet, during that short time, they had suffered so severely that all their previous encounters, both with the great king and with Tissaphernes, seemed in comparison but child's play.